You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. Today we finish up our series on margin by summarizing some of what we've learned and hearing some questions that people have raised. We um, have been looking at this idea of margin over the last few months and looking at the fact that margin's about making space. And that I've said numerous times that, that the devil's playground is, is a marginless life. That if we have no margin in our lives for God, cultivating our relationship with Him, giving Him freedom and space to speak to us and direct our steps, it doesn't matter what other margin we have in life. And so that has to be our starting point. Um, God created us with this idea that we would have margin. In the creative order of things, in the beginning of the Bible, when we look at Genesis and how God created at the end of His creation, he set, out aside, he set aside a time for rest, not because He needed rest, but uh, to model rest for us. And margin allows God the space to do what He needs to do in us. And some of us understand that that's, that's a, a tall order, that God has a lot of work uh, to do in us. Um, but margin reminds us that um, we need to give Him space to be able to do what He needs to do. We need to take time to focus on Him, to seek Him and, and His will, and He'll direct us, He'll guide us in the way that we need to, and He'll lead us towards a life of, of health and wholeness um, as we pursue that. We've, we've looked at our need for margin in different areas, um, finances, time, people, emotions, grief, our physical bodies, um, and we've seen um, what, again, what can happen when we're missing margin in any of these areas. I believe we're holistic people and that God uh, created us as emotional and spiritual and physical beings. And if we don't carve aside time um, for that, uh, then we're going to find ourselves uh, sorely lacking. And one of the things that God's really impressed upon my heart during this series is the fact that finding margin means acknowledging our own limitations. And and for me, that's a hard thing. For some of us, it may be easier to acknowledge limitations. For others of us, you know, especially in the social media world where we like to put our best foot forward, uh, it can be really hard for us to admit our limitations. But from a spiritual side of things, we know what Scripture says about admitting weaknesses, admitting failures, admitting um, limitations. Because even Paul said in one of his letters to the Corinthians that when I am weak, he is strong. And so despite what our culture may tell us, um, that uh, weakness is to be hidden and to be stuffed aside and not admitted, uh, in acknowledging our weakness to a holy God actually get, makes us stronger because it's then His strength that comes in. And um, marginless lies, like I said, can be the devil's playground. We lack margin. We fill up that space with other things that numb our pain and our hurt. And, you know, the, the, the thing about it, I think over the last few years, we've seen even in not just the, our culture and country, and, but world, uh, that there's been a major uh, mental health crisis and that there's still such a stigma for people about acknowledging that, hey, you know what, I'm not okay um, and you shouldn't look at me like there's something you know, majorly wrong with me when I acknowledge that, that mental health crisis. And we even have things in our society that will numb our pain and hurt that are socially acceptable. You know, there are those things in our society that we say, oh no, like drugs, alcohol, those things. No, those aren't acceptable ways. But, but shopping and, and immersing ourselves in work and all those other things that are, are equally numbing our pain, um, those are acceptable ways of doing that. You know, we acknowledge that our bodies, that they house the Holy Spirit. And that, um, that we also understand that in a broken and sinful world that um, we all need healing. 
And Jesus is the only one who will heal us and restore us. At the same time, the the analogy that I'd used when we talked about that was this idea of a house uh, that needs refurbishing and renovation. And you, if you have HGTV or watch these other shows, um, sorry, HGTV, sorry, HGTV. Uh, if you have HGTV and watch some of those uh, home makeover shows, then you know that there's, uh, there's those shows where people will buy a house and not to move in, but to flip it, right? But God looks at us and he doesn't say, hey, uh, there's someone I'm going to, I'm going to do a renovation in and then I'm going to, walk and go to the next house. No, he says, I want to renovate you so that I can move in. Uh, That the Holy Spirit will reside within us. And even as there's a renovation taking place, uh, God will move in and make himself at home. There will never be anything in us that Jesus needs to fix that will make him say, it's time to sell and move somewhere else. And let that just sink in because I know I had to stop and pause on that a little bit to really say, like Brendan Manning in his book, Ragamuffin Gospel, he says, Jesus loves you as you are, not as you should be. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't become who you should be, but it does mean that Jesus looks at you and he doesn't say, oh, wow, you should be ashamed of yourself. He, he doesn't say, um, shame on you for looking the way that you do know. No, Jesus says, I love you in all your imperfection, in all your brokenness, because I see you as having been created in the image of God. We will never be without hope. He will never leave us or forsake us, and our value comes from being created in the image of God. It is not unusual for me to go back and listen to my sermons. Um, if, you, if you want a humbling experience, just go back and listen to yourself. And I, since we started our podcast and started putting our sermons up online, I've been doing that and I had to get over the fact that no one ever sounds the way they think they do when they listen to themselves. So I had to go back and listen. And there's some times that I'm like, ooh, wow, that was really good. And then there's other times that I hang my head and I'm like, yeah, that was a train wreck. Um, and you know, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to, um, one of the messages I gave and there were a couple of points in there. I was like, well, that was really good. And then, uh, there were some moments that just made me cringe a little bit. And, you know, thank God. One of the values we have here at the branch is that life is messy. We need grace. And as I listened to that message, I realized that I, I, I didn't bring us to where we needed to be brought. I didn't bring us to that place where we say, you know what, I'm not always happy about what I see in the mirror, but um, Jesus is, and he meets me there, and he doesn't say, I want you to be ashamed, I want you to to go uh, like Adam and Eve, run and hide yourself. No, he says, you're my precious child and I love you. And I miss that. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I missed that. And for that, I'm, I'm sorry because I realized that, um, that yeah, if, if, if we end on anything uh, on Sundays and when we come to the Word of God, it's got to be we have to end on Jesus. Because over and over again, we can look at ourselves, we can look in the mirror and we say, no way, I can't, it's impossible. And then we have to see through that and see to Jesus who says, I can, he can. It is possible. And I can do this. And, and I didn't get there. And I ended up taking down the sermon because it was enough for me to say, you know what, I, I didn't get us there. I didn't get us to the place where I needed to and and bring that message, which is a message of grace, which is a message that Jesus is the healer, that we come before him. And that's why we need margin in order to be able to say, hey, like, no, you can't, but God can. Yes, you feel like you're not cutting it, but he is. In Romans 8, 1, Paul wrote these words. He said, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say there's some condemnation. He doesn't say there's condemnation for those who, who get it right. He says, in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. 
And that's where I, I need to end up. God doesn't look at us and say, hey, you're a slob, get yourself together. He says, I love you. Even in the mess, because you need to bring your mess to me. And heal, I will heal you. What does Jesus say? He says, come all you who are weary and heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. That's margin. And that's what we need to seek there. You know, it's funny, uh, this week, I, I, um, God does this to me regularly where there's like this convergence of conversations and books and whatever. And um, some of you have had the privilege of meeting Sam, who's our ministry intern. And um, Sam's good for me because he, he's as provocative as I am. So um, he'll say things and recommend things. Um, for my good, and he brought a book to me, which is was already on my my Amazon wish list, which isn't uncommon if you've seen my office before. Um, and uh, I picked it up, and it was a pretty short book, so I read it in a day, and I was just kind of astounded at just how. God was speaking in the midst of that. And one thing we haven't done for a little bit here at the branch that we're hopefully going to revive in January is do a book study. And I think we're going to look at this book, which is called The Cure. And um, I hope that you'll be able to join us as well, whether you can join us every time that we meet or um, if we do hybrid, which we've done before, where we have some people in person, some people online, for those of you who travel. Um, But we're going to... We're going to read through that book because I thought it was a really healthy thing for us to be reminded of what I was just saying there and giving ourselves margin Um, and remembering that um, that no, we may not always be able to do it or we may not see it, but God comes in and he heals us and he says, yes, I can do it. Don't be ashamed. You know, shame is what came in the garden when Adam and Eve knew that they'd sinned and they they were ashamed and they hid themselves and Jesus says, no, I I see you. I see you still. The other piece of this that was a reminder to me, even as I listened to my own message, was that in Acts 17, as Luke is writing about the early church, uh, he introduces the readers to a group called the Berean Christians. And he says this in Acts 17, For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And you know, that's my hope and prayer for us as a community, that that, um, you won't just take what I say and say, oh, that was nice. I'm just going to not think about it again until the next time. I mean, my hope is that what we do when we come together here on Sunday mornings is that they're like an appetizer for us that helps us want to dig deeper and go um, and meet Jesus more and more. And I hope that we're all like the Berean Christians, that we, if there's something that doesn't sit right or doesn't sound right, that uh, we don't go to how do I feel about it, but we go to Scripture and we say, hey, how does this line up with what Scripture said? Did, did what John say um, align with Scripture? Because that's what the Bereans did. And I hope that we would do the same thing. You know, giving ourselves margin is about grace. And I'm grateful for the grace that um, this community has offered me and extended me time and time again. We give ourselves margins so that we end up in the right place. And that was another piece of where I think we need to remind ourselves throughout margin is that we need to land uh, looking at Jesus. Even if it's flat on our on our face, on our stomach, and we're looking up and looking up at the cross and realizing what Jesus has done for us. In Psalm twenty seven, thirteen and fourteen, David said this, he said, I remain confident of this, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And even Habakkuk, which is a very small book, a, a minor prophet in the Old Testament 
only three chapters long and, and there's some bleak stuff that, that comes out. But even at the end of Habakkuk, the words that Habakkuk the prophet proclaims to the nation of Israel, even in their darkness, he says this, Though the fig tree does not bud, there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails, the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Now Christ took all of our brokenness, all of our marginless living, all of our imperfections, and He went to the cross. And when we feel like we're weighed down by the weight of the world, we don't take them on our own and hold them or tackle them alone. We bring them before the Lord. That's what margin, margin does for us. It gives us space to come back to the Lord. It's like an, a spiritual alignment for us. If you've ever driven a car before that was out of alignment, you know that that is not a, a comfortable ride. And if you keep doing it for too long, you know that you're going to have to replace your tires, if not other things. Spiritually, it's the same thing for us. We need to keep coming back and having that lifetime alignment thing that I got through Firestone, right? But spiritually, that, that I've got this alignment that I can keep coming back, creating margins so that God can align me back to His will again. It's an opportunity for God to align our will with His will. And if we aren't taking that regularly, uh, then we will find ourselves in difficult places. We will find ourselves with some major healing and repairs that need to be done that no, we can't do it. Yes, God can, but They could have been prevented had we taken them to Him to begin with. And so we need to be careful to not be misaligned with our time, with our money, with our physical bodies, with people, with grief, with emotions, with other things. And so all that being said, we can... um, Oh, you got it up there already. So if if anyone has questions, and I know one came in earlier this week I'm always grateful that whoever's like on top of things, they're asking these hard questions so I have at least a little bit more time than just a few seconds to be able to respond. But um, the question that <clears throat> that was asked was how can we exercise margin in differentiating between being supportive or enabling those in need? And scripturally, can you give examples of both? So if I'm hearing this correctly, it's you know margin with people. And um, how can we be supportive of somebody while not enabling them in, in what they're doing? And I, I mean, this was a hard one for me. So thank you for asking that question because I started racking my brain and saying, what does Jesus say about this? You know, Matthew ten <clears throat> fourteen, as Jesus was sending out uh, the, the apostles to go and do the work as they're going out in twos, he tells them, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. And I think there's certain times in life when we're trying to help people and they just either are refusing it or um, they're, they're just not doing what, um, what we what they should be doing. And, um, and for our own sake, sometimes we need to step away from that. Um, I think that's part of margin, is being able to say, um, hey, step away. And, and, you know, at the same time, Jesus' words in Matthew 25 kind of rang out to me when uh, he's talking about the sheep and the goats. And he says, you know, when I was sick, you, you came and visited me. Uh, when and he goes through says when i was hungry you gave me something to eat when i was naked you gave me something to wear and they said well we don't remember when you were like that and he said if you did it to the least of these you did it to me so i think it's a tension there between um <clears throat> doing things not because we're looking around to see if there's a you know instagram moment or whatever in it um but doing things um because who we're doing it for might just be Jesus in disguise. And at the same time, also realizing that if we can 
we can drive ourselves nuts about that. You know, I've got friends who I've talked through this with over and over again. Highly empathetic, highly relational people. The relationship is valued above anything else, and it's really hard sometimes um, to not step away. You know, parenting is probably one of the hardest things in that. Um, as your par- as your as your children become adults, which mine aren't yet, but they're inching towards that. Um, and knowing, okay, but where do I, you know, push? Where do I pull? Where do I just sit here? Um, and and I think this is where again we need margin, and part of this is margin in prayer, right? That we need to say, hey, God, I need. The beautiful thing is in in the Bible, in in the book of James, it says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives abundantly of all things. And so, if we don't know, and if we don't feel like we've got the wisdom, He's already told us. Come to me, ask for it, and I'll give it to you. And so if we're in a relationship and we're, we're not sure where, you know, how do we do this dance of engaging or enabling or what, ask God for the wisdom that we need to know um, that we're in the right place. Okay, my screen is refreshing here to get the other questions that have come up. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Second question that came in, can there be margin in our walk with Christ, our service, study, prayer, and worship? If so, what does that look like? Um, That's a great question too. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons or one of the things that we've tried to do at the branch is remind people um, that, that this, what we're doing now, isn't the only thing right, in our relationship with Christ. If it is, then we're doing something wrong. I mean, if Sunday morning is the limit of our relationship with Christ, uh, then um, we don't have very robust of a relationship with Christ. It has to happen outside of Sunday morning. And so I think we've got to ask ourselves, you know, how only we and God know ourselves enough to know um, where our margin is. I've seen people, and I've probably been in this place before, where I, I did a lot for God, but I didn't do a lot with God. Um, and maybe you've been there before, either hopefully not here at the branch, maybe in a, another church that you've been a part of, um, where like, church, look, I, I could sit and have coffee with you and talk for hours about my own church hurt too. Um, and the tendency at times of churches to like chew people up and spit them out and to abuse uh, relationships and to abuse gifting. And I, that's one of the reasons why Strength Finders has been so important to me because I think it's important for us to know, hey, what am I good at and how can I make sure that I'm being on purpose even within the church and especially within the church? Um, and so uh, how am I doing in making sure that I've got uh, time and space and margin. And, and I'll tell you what, there, you know, my wife has adaptability as one of her strengths, and I admire that so much, but I, I'm just not wired that way. I mean, she can just say, I'm going to paint a room today. And I'm like, ooh, you need to give me 48 hours notice for that. <laughs> like, I can't do it. I need to have, like, I need to put it on the calendar. We were talking the other day, and I said, hey, let's do this. I'm going to put it on the calendar for Friday. And she just kind of looks at me like, what, what's your problem? But I'm like, if I don't mentally prepare myself, it's going to be hard to do. I find that I need to schedule stuff. And Look, there's no shame in having a calendar where you have on there every day, like whether it's 10 minutes or 5 minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes, like margin with God. You know, put it on your calendar and and be fiercely protective of it. You know, we've said throughout this series too that um, if you don't protect it, nobody else will. Mm -mm, Not at all. So what are you doing to make sure that you're creating margin? And if you have to put it on the calendar and say margin with God, go for it. Um, and, and look, like one of the things that I try to remind people too is it's okay to say no. Like even to the people that love you and that you love. Um, if, if you need space 
Don't say, well, they're going to be disappointed with me if I don't say yes, or I'm going to miss out on something because I have got a major FOMO in my life, or wh- whatever it is. Um, it's okay to say no, and I'm giving you all permission, reluctantly, to say no to me if I ask you things at times. And say, it's okay, especially if, if saying yes would lead to marginless living, then definitely it's okay to say no. And so what does that look like to have margin in our relationship with Christ? I think it's, it's even asking ourselves and asking Him, you know, hey, God, give me wisdom to make sure that I've got margin for you in all these spaces. All right, third question. If you're trying to have the right, I think, attitude about margin in most areas with Jesus, how do you mentally welcome the problem that can produce the miracle? Ooh, man. Seriously, these are really good questions. Yeah, exactly, right? Um, I have a friend who uh, was half Chinese, and he always used to say, I don't know how many times he said it in a sermon, but that the the same uh, Chinese character for um, like challenge or struggle was the same as opportunity, I think, something along those lines. Um, you know, again, going back to the book of James where it says, you know, the testing of your faith produces endurance, right? Like, yes, we we create um, margin in our lives and we want to welcome a, a problem that can produce a miracle. And I love the way that whoever asked that worded that. Um, how do we welcome problems that produce miracles? And I'll tell you what, man, I, I've... The last couple months for me have been <laughs> a lot of that. <laughs> a, a lot of that like welcoming problems that are creating miracles and producing miracles. And I know it's not me at all. It's completely God. And it's, it's a posture thing. I mean, you know, I read the end of Habakkuk 3. I think that's, again, if we don't realign ourselves back to Jesus and keep focused again on him, then it's harder to see possibilities in problems. It's harder to see the miracle kind of hanging behind the corner or like around the bend. Um, You know, Romans 8 is one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. And there's a word that Paul uses in in Romans 8 about um, that all of creation is groaning and and looking for. And it's like this idea of craning. If you've ever, uh, my dad, when we'd go on road trips, would always say, hey, how long is it till we get there, dad? Oh, it's just around the bend. Right, and, and it gives me this idea of just kind of looking to see what's waiting around the corner. And um, I, I think it's that same idea as when we look not just at the problem and its insurmountability, but we look at the one who has dominion over all things, even that problem, and see beyond it. Um, and that's hard. I, I mean, honestly, that's why I think we need community. Because um, when I can't see it, like when this problem is staring me in the face, I can't see possibility in that. I can't see a miracle in that. God can. Sometimes my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ can. Um, but, but it's hard. It's hard. And I think, again, if, if all we're doing is just running, 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 and we're numbing, 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 there's no margin in our lives at all, it's going to be impossible to see the possibility in a problem. But if we look at it through the eyes that Jesus gives us, I think we can see a miracle much, much better. Um, and, and again, I'm not, let me just tell you, I'm not saying that from one who's perfected that. Every time a problem comes along, you must whip it. No, just kidding. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I've gone 80s on y'all. But um, every time a problem comes along, I need to be reminded regularly that I cannot tackle it and that I need Jesus. And if I don't have margin, then it, one of two things, probably lots more, will happen. I'll either um, think that I can tackle it and then, you know, somehow or another, maybe I'll scrape by and then I'll pat myself on the back and say, wow, look what I did. Or, you know, I'll just run and hide and avoid it and try to numb that down too. 
Um, and that's why, again, I think we need, absolutely need margin. Let me see if there's any other questions that came in. Good. Um, it, it, look, I say this to people when I talk and meet with them through the week anyway, is like there are questions that come up. It may be possible that as you're thinking about uh, some of these questions that afterwards you, you say, oh, I wish I'd asked that question. Or maybe you're not comfortable. You know, you don't want, oh, I didn't put them up on the screen. They're on my screen. Um, maybe you don't want, you know, anyone to hear your question because you think it's a silly question. But um, feel free to send it as an email, and I will do my best to answer it. Um, and uh, and just to put that out there, because I think it's important for us to be able to ask questions. Um, I there, you know, there's some in faith who believe that um, questions should be like stifled, and I don't believe that at all. I think God can answer every question that we have. Um, we we might not like all the answers. We might not get all the answers on this side of eternity either. But I truly believe that um, he holds all the answers, and so I don't think there's any question that's like off limits. I think we're okay um, to have questions asked. I hope and pray that God has used this series to remind you of your own need for margin. A marginless life is the devil's playground, and when we fail to have margin in our lives, we'll easily find ourselves in a bad place. May the God who created margin in the creative order of things reveal himself as you make margin for him. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.